Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and behind me is one of the libraries of the University of Chicago. So for over 100 years, the university has been a center of research and innovation. But just under 80 years ago, one of the most revolutionary advancements in science and engineering occurred just to the side of me. It was on this site that the first controlled nuclear chain reaction occurred. And today we're going to explore the story of the development of the Chicago Pile 1. So it's a story involving nearly a dozen scientists so famous your science teachers probably mentioned them to you. The game of squash, uh, nuclear waste buried in an urban park in the metro area of America's third largest city, and perhaps the greatest instance of the phrase, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission in history. So let's go ahead and let's get started. The 1930s was a really turbulent time. The Great Depression gripped the world in its economic doldrums, leading to the rise of fascism in Italy and Nazism in Germany. Japan was on the war path in China. In the United States, the Dust Bowl and widespread unemployment laid the country low. But in the field of science, everything was in flux as well. So the modern idea of the atom took shape as the electron cloud model was widely accepted. And James Chadwick's discovery of the neutron in 1932 gave us the basics of subatomic particles you learned in middle school. On top of that was the intense research in nuclear physics and the implications and applications of radioactivity. So simply put, radioactivity is the result of protons and neutrons in a nucleus of some atoms not being held as well in a nucleus as other atoms of the same type. Over time, the radioactive atom will eject subatomic particles in order to get to a stable state where the protons, neutrons, and electrons can all get along. In 1933, Ernest Rutherford, the guy who discovered protons, developed the Rutherford model of the atom. And he made a speech where he said that scientists who were floating the idea of generating energy from smashing atoms were deluded by fantasy. Hungarian physicist Leo Zilliard read the speech in the local newspaper and was so miffed about Rutherford's comments, he set out to prove him wrong. Later that day, Zilliard came up with the idea that if you could break up the nucleus of an atom, neutrons flying outward could then hit other atoms where their nucleus would then break, creating a chain reaction that could sustain itself, much like a cue ball opening a pool game. So Zilliard proposed using lighter elements for his chain reaction, but he never could make it work. However, five years later, in 1938, two German scientists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, discovered nuclear fission, the process by which a nucleus of an atom breaks into two parts, releasing a huge amount of energy. So this discovery set the scientific community abuzz and became a center of international attention and the attention of some of the brightest minds in the world. In particular, the Nobel Prize winning physicist Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi had just arrived in the United States in early 1939 to take a position at Columbia University in New York. So his move to the U.S. was not to increase his scientific credentials. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize at age 37. What am I doing? But because of the racial laws in place in Benito Mussolini's fashion, Italy that has put his own Jewish wife's life at risk. Shortly after arriving in New York, he performed an experiment which confirmed the process of nuclear fission, and thanks to Zilliard, who had immigrated to the U.S. to escape the gathering clouds of war, acquired a large amount of uranium to use in several experiments to understand nuclear fission better and determine the parameters in which a self-sustaining chain reaction could occur. Now, while Zilliard and Fermi conducted experiments to hammer out the ideas of the process of a nuclear chain reaction, Zilliard was equal obsessed with the danger of the Nazis conducting similar experiments and developing atomic weapons of their own. So knowing that he would have to sound the alarm and get the United States to boost research on atomic energy, he went out and contacted his good friend, Albert Einstein, to put his name on a letter to be sent to President Roosevelt to get his concern notice. What came out was known as the einstein zilliard letter, which explained that the state of research and asked the U.S. government to secure access to uranium for further tests and, if possible, provide support for further research. The letter was sent in August 1939. Roosevelt was concerned enough that the, with the contents of the Advisory Committee on Uranium was set up, the initial group which led to the Manhattan Project and the atom bomb, not the result the ever pacifist Einstein intended when he actually signed the letter. Experiments from 1939 to 1941, but not just Fermi and Zilliard at Columbia, but a growing number of researchers worked to solve the problem of initiating a chain reaction and keeping it going in a chamber known as a nuclear reactor. For instance, what kind of uranium should be used. Isotopes of uranium containing different numbers of neutrons were tested, and the isotope uranium-235 was found to be the best candidate. Slowing down the neutrons flying out of a nucleus that broke apart needed a material called a moderator. Heavy water, or water with an extra neutron in the hydrogen atoms, was difficult to make, expensive to produce, and it was necessary to have a lot of it to use as a moderator. Zilliard suggested that
that carbon in the form of graphite could be used as a moderator because it was much cheaper and easier to handle than heavy water. Experiments proved promising, and the U.S. government assisted in developing the purest carbon samples produced ever in the world at that time, and test by test, the theoretical calculations of a sustained controlled chain reaction came closer to reality, but they still had not reached their goal. So now you might be wondering, if Fermi and Zilliard's team was working at Columbia University in New York to demonstrate nuclear fission, how did the first successful experiment occur in Chicago? Well, this is where the story becomes intertwined with the wider story of the Manhattan Project. After the einstein zilliard letter, the U.S. government intensified efforts to develop research in atomic fission, with the broadest goal of developing an atomic bomb. Arthur Compton, a professor at the University of Chicago here and a Nobel Prize winner himself in physics, was chosen by the National Defense Research Council, the government's organization to coordinate scientific and industrial research for the upcoming war, what they seen was inevitable, to report on the development of the research of uranium. In his report, less than a month before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Compton reported it wasn't just practically possible to create a chain reaction, it was also inevitable that an atomic bomb would be created with a theoretical minimum of two kilograms of uranium. Now, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, research crystallized into developing a bomb, and Compton had to decide on where to centralize research on atomic chain reactions. So there were three main candidates for all of this research to be centered. Uh, first was the University of Cal at Berkeley, home of research by Nobel Prize winner Ernest Lawrence. Fermi's own research center at Columbia University in New York and Compton's own location here at the University of Chicago. Berkeley was the initial front runner, but while Compton was in bed with the flu, he decided to make a unilateral decision and concentrate research here at Chicago. Well, why, you ask? Well, according to official decision making, Berkeley was already diverting too many resources to the war effort. Columbia already had two top secret programs relating to uranium research and didn't want to add another. Chicago's advantage was that there were available resources nearby universities and the administration's near universal trust and support of Compton, meaning that red tape could be cut when necessary and an invaluable benefit considering events to come. Research activities at the University of Chicago were developed under the cover of the university's new metallurgical laboratory with the purpose of developing plutonium, an element developed in large quantities from uranium, that would become the basis of most nuclear weapons. So Fermi and his team arrived in the summer of 1942 and began work on their latest prototypes of their reactors. Fermi dubbed these reactors piles since the reactors were arranged in blocks of uranium surrounded by blocks of pure graphite all supported by timber beams into a big pile, if you will. The pile was to be built here in the Argonne Forest Preserve outside of Chicago, but a labor dispute, the need to build extensive facilities support the pile and the test at the site it made this infeasible, considering the timeline to develop an atomic bomb. Faced with the difficult decision of where to site the test, Compton decided to allow Fermi to complete his test at the squash courts under the grandstand of the University of Chicago's Stag Field, where previous piles had been built and tested. So Stag Field had sat unused since 1939 when the university disbanded their football team, then a member of the Big Ten, to shift the university's focus to academics. So the squash courts were cold, isolated, and made of solid concrete, all ideal for heavy-duty experimentation. Now, you might not be an expert on nuclear physics to wonder about the wisdom of setting off a nuclear chain reaction in the middle of a large city. I mean, you would, of course, be correct, as after all, all the nuclear weapons and the Chernobyl and Fukushima meltdowns all show the hazards of an uncontrolled chain reaction. Compton's decision to allow the test rested on Fermi's assurances that the safety designed into the structure of the pile meant that the chance of a runaway chain reaction was extremely low. And this is where Compton decided it was best to go ahead with the project rather than get official approval approval from university officials. Whenever he shared his decision with federal officials afterward, they were reportedly terrified and even turned white, but they trusted his decision without question. As Compton explained in his account of the events, quote, as a responsible officer of the University of Chicago, according to every rule of organizational protocol, I should have taken the matter to my superior, but this would have been unfair. President Hutchins was in no position to make an independent judgment of the hazards involved. Based on the considerations of the university's welfare, the only answer he could have given would have been no, and this answer would have been wrong." Close quote. Construction of the pile, named Chicago Pile 1, began on the 16th of November 1942 and began in the squash court with 12-hour shifts by a combination of scientists and high school dropouts looking for a little extra money. So alternating layers of graphite and graphite and uranium spheres were placed in a precise pattern 
all of which were enclosed in a cubicle balloon which was made and delivered by the Goodyear employees, oblivious to its purpose. So control the rate of the chain reaction. Control rods made of timber and cadmium sheets were attached to clotheslines and controlled by an electric motor. If the reaction was looking to go out of control, the reactor could be scrammed or shut down by simply cutting a rope and the rods would drop down instantly. On the 2nd of December, with 49 scientists present, Enrico Fermi, along with fellow project leads Herbert Anderson and Walter Zinn, began the test to start up CP1. A morning of false starts like the control rods being set incorrectly left everyone stressed out. Wisely, Fermi got everyone's attention and told him he was hungry and everyone needed to go for lunch. Two hours later, they reconvened and began to test again. At 3.25 p.m., the reading showed that the reactor had begun a self-sustaining chain reaction known as criticality. The reactor remained critical for 28 minutes until a alarm bell sounded, informing the team that the radiation levels were getting too high. The rope was cut, the control rods fell down, and the reactor was shut down. The total amount of power produced by the experiment was a half a watt, less than that of one of your small LED bulbs. Despite this tiny amount of power, it was unmistakable proof that mankind had harnessed the power of the atom and the world would never be the same. Fermi and company celebrated by drinking Chianti in paper cups from a bottle bought the year previously in anticipation of this moment. Arthur Compton called the NDRC chairman, James Conant, to give him the good news. Realizing that secrecy was necessary over the open telephone line, Compton created an impromptu code that Conant caught on to. So historical records don't exactly have the words uh, the same throughout your sources, but essentially goes like this. Conant asked how were the natives that the Italian navigator had met in the New World, and Compton's reply was that they were very friendly, which told Conant everything he needed to know about the test. So a little over a week after the first test, CP1 was activated again and generated over 200 watts of power, enough to light a light bulb. However, this created dangerous radiation levels on the squash court, and further tests were done at the original power of a half a watt. After three months of testing the, of that, that power level, the reactor was shut down on the 28th of February, 1943. Concerns over the secrecy of the program and the risk of radiation exposure to Chicago led Compton to have the pile disassembled and moved to the originally planned location, the Argonne Forest. The materials were reconfigured, and Chicago Pile 2 went online in May, allowing for continuous testing, and actually it remained in operation until 1954. A heavy water reactor named Chicago Pile 3 went online next to CP2 in 1944 and remained in operation for over a decade as well. So despite having an operational nuclear reactor within it, Stag Field was still open to students, but the squash court would remain closed to visitors. But in 1952, a plaque commemorating the reactor test was placed at the entrance. The stadium was demolished in 1957, and the site eventually became the Regenberg Library, which is where I'm standing at. On the spot where the reactor was tested, the university commissioned this sculpture entitled Nuclear Energy, designed by Henry Moore. While there's obvious cues of the structured arches and the general skull motif within a mushroom cloud, the general abstract nature of the art piece was chosen because the university wanted it to commemorate the event, not a particular person like Fermi, Zilliard, or any of the other people. Now, as for the Argonne Forest site, a year after CP2 and CP3 were decommissioned, the buildings were demolished and the site went through decontamination to make this area safe. Safe. Low level radioactive waste was buried at this site here in the trenches in, 19, in the 1940s and was later sealed with concrete to prevent further contamination. This memorial block was placed on the site of the reactors and while access was controlled for nearly 40 years, in 1998 the site was opened up to the public to visit in the Redwoods Forest Preserve, which you can actually just take a nice asphalt trail right up to the spot. So there you go, the story of Chicago Pile 1 and the first controlled nuclear reaction in human history. So like I said in the beginning, this was indeed a story involving some of the most famous scientists of the 20th century taking the first steps into the atomic age. Many of these scientists continued their research as the Manhattan Project raced to develop the first atomic bomb. While they worked to create perhaps the ultimate expression of man's propensity for destruction, Fermi, Zilliard, and all of these same people openly advocated for them to not only be used, but instead focus on the benefits of the atom and work towards peace, understanding, and hopefully a brighter tomorrow. So while we don't have the peace they hope for and nuclear weapon stockpiles do exist, thankfully atoms nowadays are essentially only split for peaceful purposes. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below and thanks for watching.